All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon or good morning, um, depending on where you're logging on from. I'm Margo Conahan. I'm ACRL's Manager of Professional Development. Thank you for joining us for today. ACRL presents a webinar. Um, I am filling in for a colleague at the very last minute, so I don't have a big introduction other than just to welcome everyone to let you know that today's session is being recorded. We will share out the link to the recording um, shortly after the event today. Um, and please feel free to use the chat to um, ask questions or comments throughout the session. We will be keeping an eye on it and um, saving your questions for the Q&A portion at the, um, after the presentation. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Margo, for filling in at the last minute. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for creating welcoming spaces and academic libraries. Uh, my name is Sarah Dornback and I'm an instruction librarian here at the University of Texas at Dallas. So let's jump right in and meet our panel. Could each of you briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, the institution where you work? Michaela Hikiakalako, Aloha Mai Kako, Ova Oshavan Matsuda. I uh, feel very lucky to be born and raised here on the island of Maui and be able to serve my home community as the head librarian at the University of Hawaii Maui College. Maui College has a head count of 2,500 students and we span four physical locations. We have a main campus in Kahului Maui and satellite locations, education centers. Uh, in Hanamoi, on Moloka'i, and Lana'i. So we spend three different islands. And so that feeds into our services and approach here as well. Uh, mahalo for having me. Looking forward to this conversation with you all. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Meyer, and I'm one of our associate deans at Grand Valley State University Libraries, which is located in Western Michigan. Grand Valley is a public institution that has just over 20,000 students, 85% of which are undergraduate or so. And we have three main campuses and four library locations across those campuses. And I'm just really excited um, to speak with all of you today and to learn from all of you too. And hello, everyone. My name is Denise Layton, and I use she, her. And I work at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, uh, University of Michigan is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, has just over 50,000 students across um, undergrad and graduate students. Um, we're in ARL, so focused on research. And um, we have six public locations. Um, and we also uh, partner or you know, have two other campuses who we, we um, partner with at times as well um, in Dearborn and Ann Arbor. And yeah, thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. We're so happy to have you here today to share your knowledge and experience. Um, let's jump into the first formal question now. Uh, we start with kind of a definition in a way. Can you tell us what does it mean to be welcoming and how do you apply this concept of being welcoming to your academic library? Sure, and I'll get us started with this. Uh, so for me, this asks, how do you invite communities in uh, with the understanding that what it means to be welcoming may be different depending on your cultural background, your particular context, your location. For example, I mentioned we're on multiple islands and uh, even within an island, there's various uh, different contexts depending on what part of the island you may be on. Uh, and this, uh, of course, our, our college has international students as well. So there's those contexts and so how do we consider this when we ask ourselves, are we being welcoming? And part of that should also involve the question of do students see themselves in the library? And a couple of ways that we can uh, look at this is through representation in the visually in the physical space, as well as the representation within staff, uh, librarians and library workers, and in the approach to service. So as I mentioned, depending on what cultural context you may come from, there may be different approaches to service that is most appropriate depending on that context. Visual representation is often uh, equated to art in library, but I've seen cases where it tends to be a checkbox. They add, so I, my focus has been more with indigenous uh, populations, specifically Native Hawaiians. And I noticed that for some, they add a piece of art 
that uh, comes from our communities or from a particular Native artist, and then they check a box and say, there, we, we've done it. Uh, and so I really challenge folks to move beyond that and question, yes, include the art, which I'll talk about more <laughs> later, uh, but also look at what are other ways that contribute to your space and how else can we create those welcoming spaces that recognize BIPOC uh, visually and in the experience. I think libraries at, at current have maybe more widely acknowledge the whiteness in libraries and the systemic racism that continues today on a daily basis. Uh, but what are we doing and what can we do to address that? I think that's very much part of the welcoming approach. So taking critical look at our hiring practices and for existing staff, how are, what opportunities are we pursuing to learn about the place that we're working in and the communities that we seek to serve? And then uh, finally, I think when assessing, it is important, all of these areas and more, uh, it's important to ask who does this serve and what voices are being left out. So whether you're pursuing a new initiative or you may, the budget may not be available and you're just reworking existing things, well, who does it serve? Question why you're doing the thing that you've been doing for 10 years uh, or even further, even longer. Uh, and I acknowledge the, maybe it's, sometimes it's slightly easier for those of us who are newer to a library to come in with those fresh eyes, but we definitely need to, or it's beneficial, at least in my case, to benefit, uh, to collaborate with those who have been in libraries and been on our campus for a while because they come with institutional knowledge that really bolsters the efforts that we move forward as we try to create welcoming spaces. Yeah, and I, I really agree with all of that approach. Um, and I think that uh, it, in terms of um, uh, space being welcoming, I like to think about um, understanding the barriers of the space being welcoming. So that, that touches on a lot of the things that Siobhan was saying, like the cultural backgrounds that people are bringing in, the historical context of your institution. Um, I, I often you know, I work at University of Michigan. It's um, a historically white institution. Um, our, our history is very colonialist, um, it, you know, in terms of our origins, right? We have this origin story that in 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Badawatomi nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan, seated in the Treaty of Fort Miggs, so that their children could be educated. Um, so, like, the, that's like, a land acknowledgement statement that sometimes people say, but if you dig even a little bit into the history, you can see that um, Native American students weren't attending University of Michigan um, openly until the 1960s and 70s. So that's just one aspect of our history that 150 years later, right, like wasn't happening. Um, and so like that legacy lives on and it is in our physical spaces, especially because um, uh, here at my institution, some of the our buildings are quite old, um, and like the legacy of the building can actually be one of those barriers. Um, even the name of your building, um, for example, in 2018, we had a push to change one of our building names, CC Little, um, to uh, just uh, an unnamed building. Um, he was a known and like avid eugenicist and you know that was five years ago so there's there's just a lot of work to kind of like dig back into the history and understand you know how how to, that is perceived as new students come to our campuses every year and we try to say you're welcomed here yes we want to serve you too but actually we hold this this history and um you know it's our jobs to dismantle that and uh bring it a new for students to to really be genuine to say like we you are welcome here. Siobhan and Denise, your answers were so complete, but I'll just add that, you know, when I think about what it means to be welcoming, I, I really think about how all aspects of your space. So you both touch on some of them, you know, the architecture, the interior design, the entrance, wayfinding service points, employees who, who are at those service points, all of that should really suggest to, to people that you belong here. And so as we've applied that concept in our library, we try to really think about the fact that we want students to feel like the library space is their space, it's not our space, and we really want all students to feel like that, not just some students. Yeah, 
Thank you all so much uh, for your answers there. You um, mentioned in different ways um, that our students, our patrons have uh, these different backgrounds. And so that leads into the next question we have, which is, um, can you offer some examples of ways that your library has created a welcoming space for people of very diverse backgrounds? I can start this one. And like Denise, Grand Valley is a predominantly white institution. And yet our this last incoming class was the most diverse group of students in Grand Valley's history. And so we, we do know that representation really matters. And so for us, one of the things that has been really important is thinking about how we can implement inclusive hiring practices to sort of help get us to having a more diverse faculty, staff, and student colleagues. Siobhan, you mentioned in the first answer that you really challenged us to go beyond just thinking about artwork and spaces. And that's something we've been thinking about recently. So we are working with our art gallery to do a refresh to have more diverse artwork and specifically artwork by BIPOC artists. But then we've also, um, you know, Grand Valley is a very young institution. We have had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of portraits of wealthy white donors in our spaces. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about in an emerging project is to create something we're calling the Beacons of Hope. And so that's a partnership with our art gallery and our Office of Inclusion and Equity. And that Beacons of Hope portrait gallery will be commissioned pieces highlighting notable alumni of color. Another thing that we've tried at Grand Valley, which is pretty common, I think, is, is to offer different Heritage Month book displays and exhibits. And then again, sort of building off of that, and an, another emerging idea that we've just, we're just getting ready to, we're right in the beginning phases of this, is to partner with the Black Book Exchange to install one book house outside of our one of our library spaces that's supplied with books that thoughtfully represent Black people, stories, and culture. And I just want to give a big shout out to my colleagues, J Jordan Horton and Stacey Burns, who uh, came up with this idea and pitched it and are leading that project. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that when our Mary Itama Pew Library Learning and Information Commons was built 10 years ago, one of the design principles was to make learning visible. And one of the things that we realized through post-occupancy assessment is, of course, there's a lot of positives that come with that sort of the open sight lines and things centered around making learning visible. But another thing we learned is that there's not a lot of great space in this building for students who have lower sensory needs. And so right away we had identified if we ever have a longer term project, we would want to sort of um, make some of our study rooms that were made for 12 people or six to 12 people smaller. Um, but then in the sort of short term, one of the things we did is start to check out focus tools. So things like noise canceling headphones, and things that can help create a lower sensory environment despite all of those open sight lines. So those are a few things that we're um, working on and I'll turn it over to Denise. Yeah, so um, in terms of ways that our, our library has worked to create welcoming spaces for people of diverse backgrounds, um, part of our approach has been recognizing that um, people from different backgrounds have, have different needs and um, also trying to support folks um, as, as whole people, not just as students or users of our services, but as um, people on a, on a journey. They're, they're here at the university for their own personal reason, whatever it might be. And while they're here, they, they need different supports. Um, they need to be able to get their work done, which is why they come to our library spaces. But hopefully while they're here, they also feel uh, seen by library staff. Um, they feel like they they have the, um, you know, they have a, a cafe, right, where they can they can eat. They have a microwave where they can heat up their food from home if they can't be buying food on campus all the time. Um, 
And so in part with that, we've, we've worked to really um, commit resources to programming, especially at the end of the semester in terms of um, uh, supporting students during exams. Um, so instead of uh, just encouraging students to take a break, uh, actually giving students food, um, putting on activities where they could be taking a break, giving out handouts that encourage taking a break on your on your own time, um, and also giving students a space in particular that uh, was made not for studying, but um, just, just for that take a break. And the reason I say take a break is because I think it's something that we as libraries can actually do. Uh, we can promote other mental health resources on campus, um, but we are not a, a mental health resource ourselves um, in terms of the the expertise that we're giving, at least not at my institution. So um, that's something that we've been trying to do in terms of recognizing student needs. And then um, we've also been doing efforts to um, try to dedicate different spaces that have uh, that are trying to meet needs of different student populations in particular um, in that way of recognizing that not all students' needs are the same. Um, and so I wanted to share today our student parent and caregiver room. Um, so we recently uh, partnered with the um, Michigan Caregivers and Student Parent Association, well, not association, just student group. Um, and we partnered with them to create this room um, where we were, uh, we, we have um, a lot of different resources here, different seating options, um, you can see that uh, we have these chairs that uh, our, our student partners that our student parents thought was really good for um, like breastfeeding or pumping in the gray chair. We have um, books for kids of all ages. And uh, this is a space that's dedicated just for students who are parents on campus. They're the only people who have access to it. They can use it whenever our building is open. We're a 24-5 building. Um, and so in this space, they can um, meet together uh, if they want to or um, bring anyone they might want. If they're bringing their kids to campus, we feel like we have we have more resources in this space. It's also um, close to an all gender restroom. We installed a changing station in there. We hadn't had that before. And so this partnership led to us making changes like that. Um, so really partnering really deeply with the student group and creating the space that they wanted um, was a big step for us in terms of trying to promote our library space as a welcoming one to people of diverse backgrounds. Awesome, and I'm glad you shared that photo so we get to see what it looks like in that space. Uh, similar to Denise, we've also I mean, we found that food brings people together. So in addition to self-care and, you know, the importance of meeting basic needs for students and making sure they are eating during finals week, but on any given day, um, uh, we've also found the added benefit that it brings people together. And so some of the things we've done is we've started just to have coffee every Monday. You can count on us having coffee if you need a pick-me-up. Uh, and it's it was sort of more budget friendly than I thought it would be. Uh, and then we've also done, we've brought in skillets and just cooked up pancakes right in the entrance of the library. Uh, and a staff member has a banana tree in their yard. We cut up bananas, now it's banana pancakes. We get creative where we can. We've also done popcorn bars during midterms and finals. And then we do the classic pizza parties on occasion. The more popular, I mean, I think students have gotten used to the pizza parties. so pretty much anything not pizza at this point gets more interest than, than the pizza, which was a little surprising for us. Or, you know, if it's not the uh, particular pizza place that camp every campus place goes to, then it's like, oh, something different. And that gets their attention. Uh, we've also done uh, uh, more other things such as uh, providing clear signage for wayfinding in the library, uh, in the occupied nation of Hawaii, English and Olalo Hawaii are recognized uh, languages here. And so we added Olalo Hawaii to our signage. We're the first academic library to do so. And since then, other libraries within the University of Hawaii system has also have also implemented and are in the process of implementing. Uh, this can could involve budget, but it could also be very simple. We happen to have signs that we could replace the vinyl. And so it was almost 
I mean, the process of coming up with the signage was more of a process than the actual changing the sign part. Uh, we've also, in small ways, invite engagement near the entrance with low entrance with low risk options. So we just put a whiteboard near the entrance and our student workers will put up prompts on a, on a weekly basis and it allows students to indicate what shows they're watching, which teams they're cheering for, what's their mood today, like which Spider-Man do they like the best, you know, something that's just really low risk but gets them conversing uh, informally. And most of the time it brings out humor, which is especially appreciated around midterms and finals, I will say. Uh, and then it's been mentioned already, but we've also done a variety of programming. And that's where we've really been able to invite people in to showcase their expertise and community partnerships, as well as members of the community and cater to the interests of students. So anytime we're bringing in a tour or anything like that, I always express to students, this is your space. So what, whatever it is that you'd like to see happening here, we want to hear all of those things. And one of the ways we've been able to integrate, uh, well, I'll just share one quick example of something that I think the entire process brought together student voices into the library. Uh, and ironically, this one does include art, but uh, we, let me get this up, we, I partnered with our Kekaulike internship program, and we brought in Native Hawaiian students at Maui College to intern in the library in what was focused on art and the research process. So these are some of our students. So the summer internship involved researching and that involves, you know, looking in databases and looking at local artists and those kinds of things, but also physically walking around in the community to look at other murals that are existing very nearby to our campus, but they maybe just drive by and never took, you know, a second to stop by and really look at it. They've also talked with cultural practitioners because uh, the focus obviously was Ike Hawaii or Hawaiian knowledge. And they came up with the entire theme. And you'll see Aubrey Matsuura, who's one of our Hawaiian Studies faculty involved here as in guiding the students through the art process. And then I, of course, provided research support. And this is in our smart room. So this is what it looked like before. Notice the bare walls is what I'm trying to show. I should also mention while we're showing this image that all of the furniture was also selected with students in terms of what kind of needs they wanted. So. Closer to the front here, you'll see the high tables. They wanted the Starbucks feel of like high bar tables. So that's why that's there. But anyway, uh, so this is what it looked like before. And one of our students created this quick video to show you what the mural turned like turned out like afterwards. And again, this is a student-led mural. They selected the theme. They researched the cultural context and what are the elements that they want to emphasize within this space and within our campus. And so in addition to creating this mural, they also planned a public lecture and spoke at that lecture as well as inviting other community leaders. And they also uh, organized a, a component wherein community were able to participate. So you'll see all of the intricate stamping in there so that we had folks from toddlers to kupuna or elder just be coming in and putting their stamp on the mural. And since then, this space has turned into the most popular study space on our campus, uh, definitely within the library, but on our campus, and has come to host a variety of events, uh, including guest speak. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to, including guest speakers and uh, poetry readings and. Uh, information literacy workshops, et cetera. So in addition to having the student voices literally organize and design the space and the walls and the visuals, we also incorporate them, the murals into our programming as well. And so those are some of the ways we've been able to bring in different community members and different expertise. Uh, in this case, highlighting those from art and Hawaiian studies, but it's a really Great example for us in terms of a turning point for our library, wherein we changed from white walls to bringing people into these spaces. That, that is wonderful. Thank you all for sharing these examples, these beautiful examples um, that you've, you've brought to your own libraries. Um, just a note to the panelists, we are doing just perfectly on time. So thank you all for that, appreciate it.
We are going to change gears just a little bit and move toward a question on uh, assessment and evaluation. As um, many of us in libraries um, and higher education know, assessment and evaluation are an ongoing process in uh, most of our day-to-day -day work lives. Um, we are often asked to uh, count or provide some sort of statistics on the services we are providing to our users or even somehow quantify the value that we add to our institutions. Um, this is uh, hard to do with a concept like being welcoming. Um, that said, assessment and evaluation will always be an important part of our job. So, uh, could you comment on some ways that you have measured progress or success uh, in making your libraries welcoming spaces? Yeah, um, so I, I, I agree that it is hard to to measure and quantify like the feeling of feeling more welcome or not, um, even to understand what kind of scale you might be doing that on. Um, and so my scale that I'm, I'm typically working on in promoting to my administration and other partners is really just thinking about user needs all the time. So going out and doing, you know, what we, so I'm kind of, I'm like a, a, a UX person, I guess I identify as like a UX person, somebody, somebody who does service design, um, and so in terms of learning about the user experience, um, uh, I've done different projects, some where what is called more like discovery user experience research, where you're going out and learning about um, an experience and that's that's the goal, right? And that really helps you gather information about user needs. So I've worked on projects where we're just asking students um, about their needs for the library um, and that baseline of information has been helpful uh, year over year in terms of understanding what projects we might um, pilot out of that. So if students are saying, um, you know, I, I need a, a space. Um, well, the most common thing is, is very functional things, I think. Um, and there's this piece of being welcoming that is just functional, right? Like, when I come in, I know where to go. Um, when I come in, I'm greeted with somebody who can help me. Um, and uh, like something we've learned and, and recognize is that getting around our buildings is really hard. And so um, in that, we then put forward work to improve our signs and create more of a sign strategy um, and did like a full inventory of all of our signs and have worked really on a multi-year project. I think I started working on signs in the library in like 2015. Um, so these things take time, especially in physical spaces in order to make changes. Um, and I think that's an important factor in terms of assessment and how quickly we're making change. Um, but really started then in terms of um, creating the signs. And so, you know, we, we hear that user need, we try to improve it with some kind of intervention, and then we evaluate whether or not that intervention is working and having the effect that we wanted it to um, on improving the user experience. Um, and so uh, just recently, um, I'm working on a project with students where we actually tried to take that up a notch, um, where uh, we've, we've heard an experience that students don't even think they can come, in, undergraduate students don't even think they can come into the graduate library because of its name being the graduate library. Um, and so like a student of mine, for example, she said she didn't even come in for the first few months because um, she just didn't think she was allowed in the space. Um, and so we're working on a project where we are creating a game um, to help students uh, wayfind in the library. And then of course we're evaluating it again. So um, really my, my method is um, in terms of like trying something out that fits into what we know about user needs. And then if there's something we don't know about, if there's new information um, about maybe a certain population that we want to know more about their experience on campus, um, building those relationships to learn. Um, in particular, uh, another kind of discovery research I've been working on recently 
was um, really specifically about what makes this space welcoming um, and understanding what sense of belonging means to students within our spaces. Um, and so we did some focus groups with uh, student employees to hear their perspective about um, we're working here and the type of space that we're creating and is that promoting sense of belonging on campus or is it not? Um, and I think that helped us with the language around, first of all, how do people even conceptualize wel welcoming or a sense of belonging um, so that later I can, I can maybe do a broader study with um, students who aren't student employees and uh, learn more about that experience and then proceed to try an intervention where we, we try to improve the experience. So I, I see it as really cyclical, um, but really the, the basis of that measurement is, are we moving forward on um, improving people's user experiences, meeting user needs um, and being as inclusive as we can um, and really taking into account the, uh, different needs of different populations on the campus and recognizing that not everyone is the same. Um, and so coming to our spaces with, with different expectations and experiences and how can we meet them where they are. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about my approach. Yeah, I thanks Denise. I, I think we've also done the similar things in terms of regular surveys we've done program specific and general library annual library surveys program specific have focused on integration of technology in the library we do a tech loan program so how did that go were you able to use your device those kinds of things uh, and then we've also done first year experience type surveys where we were able to partner with existing campus surveys we have intake surveys for new students online learning surveys to, and in there we were able to add, you know, do you have access to reliable internet, which is an, an issue here, uh, and uh, computers, those kinds of things. So we're very aware in our library and on our campus of survey overload for students and the tendency for institutions to survey regularly and act on occasion. And so, <laughs> we're trying to make sure that we are not participating in that. We've, we've I've talked with students who do not wanna answer the survey because they gave their thoughts and nothing, they saw no changes. And so being aware of that when, you know, you're, you're going in thinking, I'm asking you what you want, I wanna meet your needs and not being aware of, you know, 10 other people have already asked them and they've seen in action. So being aware of that when entering into any of these conversations. Uh, some of these surveys were written surveys or online surveys. And at one point, I don't know if you've ever been to those airports that have like the smiley faces and you just press the button. We tried that at, at, at our entrance or at our exit just to see, you know, how happy or sad were you during your visit today? Uh, so that was like a minor way to get uh, them to share feedback. And not surprisingly, our students uh, gave us usually 90% plus were positive. And I say not surprisingly because our students are great, but you know we really question what can we really do with this? What is just an interactive component and in getting them to engage? And what is what types of feedback uh, or measures can we actually act upon? And so, in addition to those sort of more light opportunities for feedback, we've also uh, held focus groups with students. As Denise shared, it was fairly easy to work with our student workers. They're already in the library. They have friends. Bring in the friends. Let's have some sort of lunch uh, and have a conversation around it. And I will say, because for us, budget is an issue. So we didn't always have lunch. Sometimes it was a conversation that we're having with a club about an event they want to have. And then we throw in two or three questions so that we can feed into initiatives we're already working on. And it flows seamlessly. There's not an abrupt, okay, so we're, you're going to get the food for that and we're going to do this. And then, oh, and also, what are your technology needs? No, it was definitely a flow in conversation where the opportunity ar arose. Uh, and some of those focus groups with students, the questioning, again, is very important. It's semi-structured conversations and sometimes completely informal conversations wherein we're asking students, what would enhance your college experience? What's missing from our campus? What are the things that you would help you? And for some students, what are the things that might help your friend? Because it's easier for some to think about, oh, I think it'd be really helpful for them, uh, but really it'll help them as well. So those conversations have been really fruitful for us, but you also get some 
great and yet off the wall ideas like we should make half the floor an aquarium very cool and very helpful for the conversation to move people beyond common perceptions and misperceptions of libraries uh, but there's an understanding that we probably won't get the half floor aquarium but we can make a small aquarium <laughs> uh, we can do those kinds of things or is are you interested in ocean sciences those are the kinds of ways we can engage you uh, and then we go from there. So again, partnering with student workers and their friends, club leaders, folks we see regularly in the library, and then going outside of our building to talk with those that we aren't seeing. Because if we're only serving those who are already in the library, you're missing out on a lot of those voices. And those are the folks in a lot of these situations that we're trying to capture and bring in. That sounded more worse than, it. you know, invite them into our spaces. <laughs> and, and so, those are some of the ways we've worked with students. We've also worked with faculty, and one of the examples for this has been the in, what is commonly referred to here as the NOOPU study, which is a research support needs of Hawaiian studies faculty, and that was a study done in partnership with librarians at other UH camp University of Hawaii campuses, and we interviewed faculty in Hawaiian studies who not only participate in research and scholarship themselves, but also are in charge of teach in, in teaching research to their students. And so what are the particular needs that those that population uh, on our campus needs or wants? Where are the holes or gaps in service and where can we fill? And so that was a study done in partnership with Ithaca SNR. And I make you my little note to share the link in the chat. Uh, in case you want to take a look. And I know that the similar a similar study was done at other universities in the United States, Canada, and uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so maybe there was one done in your area focusing on the indigenous populations uh, in your surrounding communities. And if not, what kinds of things might you be able to pick up with there in that for examples of recommendations to move forward or questions when you're going out to community? How can you engage? What are the particular approaches people make? And I want to emphasize throughout this that uh, the surveys, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the focus groups, all of that does not just start by itself. There's a lot of relationship building that is involved for how meaningful you want those uh, measures to take place. Like what kind of assessment, like I said, they can click the happy button all day long, uh, but until you build that relationship with them and they feel comfortable sharing really what's going on with them and really where their needs are, that's where you really get into the heart of the work and begin to make systematic changes in your library. Uh, and in, in that sense, I think in addition to all of these things, it's really the response from your campus community that's going to make a difference. And you'll get these things in surveys and conversations, but you'll also get these things by going to events that are seemingly unrelated to the library or walking around campus. I'll get just people bumping into me and having those conversations that way. And amazing partnerships come out of that. So don't, as much as you're planning out all the things, there's things you can't plan for, but be open to those opportunities as well. Thanks so much, Siobhan. Kristen, do you have some thoughts to share on this one? Yeah, Siobhan, I'm so glad you highlighted the relationship building aspect and also all of the methods that you and Denise shared. I'll just make my answer pretty short, but I'll share that like most of the initiatives that we try that are geared towards increasing sense of belonging in our spaces or is meant to be some kind of welcoming gesture to students we usually do take some time to just consider in advance, like what does success look like? How will we know if we want to keep doing this, if we want to stop doing it, or if we need to iterate? And that looks, it can look really different depending on what the initiative is. So, you know, for our focus tool initiative, for example, we had, first of all, like gotten feedback on the idea and did some prototyping with a student group. But then we also said, okay, well, we'll look at circulation stats. We'll have an optional survey for students who check out the materials. And we'll also record any comments that we get or questions that we get at the service desk. And if we get some, you know, positive feedback through that, that that'll be one of our measures of success. And I just want to Sarah, you had mentioned, of course, that we often have to make a case in libraries for what we're doing and making that sort of budget ask, demonstrating impact. But I would just say when it comes to creating welcoming spaces, it's not always about serving the most or that the like the numbers might not be the highest right for the things that we're doing. And so 
uh, it'll always stick with me. I remember when I we were prototyping the focus tool idea and I was talking to this student group, one of the students who, who did mention that he would, it really supports his learning to have a lower sensory environment. And he said, you know, I got to be honest with you. I'm not sure how often I'll come in and check out these tools, but knowing that you have them just makes me feel more welcome here and that you actually, you really care about me as a student. And so it's that, it's also that that's difficult to quantify that I do think numbers aren't the whole game when it comes to this work. And we need to be thinking about that. Yes, so true, so true. Um, we are gonna move on to our last planned question and then start taking some questions from our audience. Um, so just down to the wire here, what is your top tip or suggestion for academic librarians, academic libraries, um, any library worker really to help make their library a welcoming space. Yeah, I think my my top tip is um, going back to understanding um, how people are experiencing your institution. So if if you feel like you know about that, then trying some things out uh, about uh, taking down some barriers to inclusion and welcomingness. Um, if you feel like you don't know a lot about it, try try to start forming relationships with with student groups on campus. You know, meeting with people, um, just getting out there in the community and talking to people. Um, and uh, so that you know that is time, of course, but it can be done without a more specific budget. Um, I think the other thing for me would be to recognize how you're showing up in this space, um, the own power, your own power and privilege that you're bringing, um, and how that is impacting the conversations you might be having, um, and really just making sure that you understand uh, how your institution has participated in perpetuating systems of oppression um, in higher education. It's it's an institution built out of Western ideas of um, what education is. Um, so there are pieces for all of us to kind of unpack there and making sure that, um, again, you're understanding how you show up in the space. I think my top tip is just to consider the questions that you're asking yourself and really pausing and slowing down to ask those questions. And so just a few questions that we've been asking ourselves lately is, you know, how are we considering representation in our staffing and space design choices? Who's at the table for these decisions and how have we tried to surface perspectives from marginalized voices? How might we decenter whiteness in our spaces? And then how might we create accessible spaces beyond ADA requirements? And I think asking yourself those questions is part of the work and the answers might look really different depending on your institution, but it's, it's the pausing and asking that I think is really important. I agree. I agree with both of these panelists. <laughs> Uh, I think first and foremost, those developing of relationships with those uh, that we seek to serve. And part of that, as Denise pointed out, is, is recognizing your role, your positionality and the power structures that you either work within or continue to uphold. And so being aware of that as you enter and develop into these relationships. Denise also mentioned the impact of the history of an institution and I would extend that to the institution of libraries and what ways libraries have functioned in our communities and really encourage you to critically engage with these, uh, the history as well as like on an everyday basis, not just microaggressions, but the, like systemically, there's a lot that we can engage with. There's tons of opportunity there to improve our institutions uh, all together and individually. And part of that, I would encourage folks to learn about the places that you work in, uh, not just the institution, but the place and the community that you work and live in, uh, particularly those of you who may be working in spaces that you're not from, um, and see how 
knowledge of that place and that community informs your work and will enhance your work and it makes it much more funner honestly uh and I think in terms of tips, I, I want to go back to one of the first things I shared in the first question in terms of hiring practices. I think if we really want to see change in our library, we need to see change throughout. And that includes our library workers and not just diversity within the staff, but at all levels of staff. So we need diversity in library workers. We need like diversity in librarians, in library administration, and then throughout the campus, it also helps to bolster these uh, uh, efforts. And then, I would say be realistic with budget, but don't let it deter you from taking action. Dream the dream big, like the biggest dream that you can with your team, bring them all along with you uh, and then find ways that you can get there. And as others have mentioned, it may be a gradual process, but it's important that you're taking a step. And when missteps happen, recognize that it's an iterative process. And so, don't take the misstep as I'm no longer going to engage. Rather, you know, I, I learned from this uh, experience. I'm going to make sure that I, you know, try not to make that mistake again, but I'm going to continue moving forward in this direction because as, as great it, as it can be, it can also be very challenging. So, you know, be kind to yourself and be kind to those who are on your team because it is very iterative and there's going to be challenges. We're dealing with at least like a hundred years, depending on the institution, but even in the sense of library and white supremacy, you're dealing with decades, if not hundreds of years of, of things. And so sometimes it'll be a slow process, but sometimes you, if you really sit and have conversations, there are easy wins that you can accomplish that keeps the morale up and keeps you going. Uh, and then I would also say venues like this, where you can have conversations with folks, join in, you folks are already here, so you're already doing it but encourage others that you're trying to onboard into your, your dreams, bring them into these spaces as well too, so you can expose them uh, to all of these wonderful, all of the wonderful work that's going on. Sometimes it's siloed. You may be the only one in your institution. So count on this network, especially in libraries, we're so uh, willing to network and share with each other. And I think that's a beautiful thing about our profession. And so call upon that, because I think a lot of us are engaging. There may not be a model, but there are some, we've definitely made lots of efforts and there's lots of initiatives. And so in that, there's lots of learning to happen. Uh, together again. Yeah, there sure is. Um, definitely together, um, I think is the, the key here. It has to, it can't be just one person, but lots of people together. So thank you all so much for those tips and suggestions. Uh, let's move into the uh, portion of this webinar where we answer some audience questions. Um, we seem to have had an active chat. Um, so I'd like to start with one question, which could go to any or all of the panelists. So once I read this, um, go to any of you. What can you do when your basic student, staff, faculty surveys all give glowing praise about the library and indicate a welcoming feeling? But when you meet with a student's faculty, staff one on one, they tell you that they don't actually feel welcome. So what can you do when the surveys and a one on one don't necessarily match? I don't know that I have a um, fantastic response for this, but I, I just wonder as those conversations happen, you know, Siobhan mentioned the importance of relationship building. And so like what a gift if you're getting that feedback one on one. And I just wonder if that's an opportunity to pause and ask some questions about, you know, like can you tell me more about where you feel welcome on campus or where, where are other spaces in the community where you feel welcome? And can you tell me about that? And how does that differ from how the library feels to you? That could just digging into those, that feedback could be really helpful. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Siobhan or Denise, did you wanna weigh in on that one as well or move on? I think I would just echo Chris. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to echo Kristen. I think that's exactly what I would I would do. Yeah, and I would encourage them to bring in others as well. If if they aren't the only one feeling that, and chances are they're having that conversation with others as well. And so maybe having a small group conversation might be helpful. 
But as Kristen shared, if they're having that interaction with you, that's a success. And I think continue to engage with that person as long as they'll engage with you to bring in those things. And some of the areas that I've had success when students have said that is to lead to what are your interests? And then we'll plan an event around that and we'll bring them into the core of planning that event. This isn't possible for all students. But I've saw that I've seen that be successful. And then in other cases, it's been, you know, issues of like the hours or those kinds of things. So we find creative outlets, whether it be, you know, lockers outside of the library or sometimes physically dropping it off to a student who, whose car broke and can't come in. So, I mean, there's a spectrum, but it's, it's how far are we willing to meet the student in this? And I think for whoever's asking the question, you're clearly making headway with um, providing a welcoming space that they feel the comfort to confide in you in this way. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add that I think on the survey side, you maybe critically look at the types of questions you're asking on your survey. Why why isn't this coming through there? Is there any edits you can make to the survey? Can you add um, a more qualitative question here or there to, to get more open answers beyond just like five on satisfaction scale? Um, so if, if you have any flexibility there, um, I might think about looking there too. Excellent. Okay, this next question is for Denise. Um, is the parent family room open to staff or faculty with children, uh, along with students with children? Um, it's mainly focused on students because it's it's formulated as a study room, right? So I think that it, you know any level of student is kind of where we're thinking at in terms of the audience. Um, it, it's still a new partnership and there's opportunities for um, expansion in terms of uh, who can use the room. Um, by connecting with this student group, they reached out to us and we were able to respond and really work with them. Um, and they, they often say that, you know, they reached out to a lot of other people on campus and we were the only ones who responded. Um, and so, uh, you know, from that, we've been able to, I've been able to participate in other um, advocacy groups on campus for student parents and also faculty and staff parents um, and been connected to those ally groups. And so I think there's, there's more opportunity, but um, we really have kind of scoped the room as a study room for students. Great, thank you, Denise, for answering that one. Uh, this next one is for uh, the group. Have you noticed a change in how students use library spaces since the pandemic? And how have you addressed those changes in need? Um, we've definitely noticed a higher need for um, hybrid and virtual options, just more people doing Zoom meetings throughout the day and needing a, a space to be able to do that. So I think that points to one of the things about like functionally your space has to work in order for people to feel welcome there. Um, and so we've been able to um, add, we, we recently renovated a floor and part, through part of that, we were able to add some booths that are like those, you like open the door and then it's like soundproof inside. So that, you know, is, you know, on the more expensive side of prop, um, solutions, but I think you can also think about, you know, are there rooms that you can use in a different way? Um, we've often thought about like our staff conference rooms and what are they doing after business hours? Um, it, we're open 24 or five and we also have extended hours in other buildings and can we give students more access to those rooms? Um, so, and also um, another thing uh, we've done is to set up um, zoned spaces. So trying to set expectations about um, what behavior can be done in what space, not in a like restrictive kind of way, but more in a way of like, oh, um, I know that I can do this activity in this space and it relieves my stress in terms of searching for a space like that um, and uh, or like going into a space and not knowing how to use it. So we started that last year labeling spaces as like a collaborative zone or a focus zone 
um, which maybe people don't always think in terms of being a, a welcoming aspect, but I think um, when students know how to interact with your space, they, they feel more comfortable and they feel that maybe sense of belonging. I agree. And I think uh, we've also looked at study rooms and how can we, we don't have the luxury of being able to add like a Zoom room. And so we're looking at our study rooms and saying, how can we enhance this, honestly, on a, on a low budget, low, low to no budget. And so we reach out, I reach out to our media team. Do you have any extra, you know, noise? Uh, I thought it was noise canceling, but it's noise proofing or there's particular language I'm learning. And so, you know, do you have anything that we could put up to, to help our students? Uh, or do you have extra HDMI cords and things like that that we can make available to our students? Um, we've also, I've, I've seen an uptick in headphones. We've had headphones forever, but, you know, maybe two or three people use them. Now they need them because they're doing Zoom classrooms. And if they don't already have a laptop with headphones, they, they need headphones. And also, you know, you forget your AirPods at, AirPods at home sometimes. Uh, so those types of needs are picking up. I think in terms of technology, the need for laptops and Wi-Fi, as I mentioned earlier, has been huge. We've we had a technology loan program prior to COVID, but the inventory has doubled, if not tripled. And the question here is, how do we sustain this post, you know, CARES and her funds? Uh, because we know that that is a need. And in a time where universities are emphasizing the importance of equity, this is what it means to come to the table on equity. And, you know, there is a, a, a resource allocation that's needed there. Uh, I also want to point out for, for, for food, we have a microwave. We allow eating anywhere in our library, which is, I know, not possible for everyone. But we've also been able to add small items because our campus food options have been very limited post-COVID because there's not as much demand, so they can't support longer hours. And so we have things like, you know, that can be warmed up like mac and cheese or other small and cheap things that students can um, pick up in the library. So they don't have to leave, which means, you know, if they leave, they're likely not coming back and that they're on, they're on to the rest of the chores for the day or whatever it might be. And so providing that opportunity to eat while you study and has, has been very helpful. Uh, and we then have conversations around, you know, what kind of needs do you have there? that also stemmed into basic needs. And so we partnership with basic needs to bring a food market in during finals week. And that was the most popular basic needs event that that department had had. And so this is a partnership that we'll look forward to, to strengthening as we move forward. Uh, so in addition to Zoom rooms and tech needs and the food, I also wanna point out something that maybe we're talking about and maybe not. And, and in terms of how the hybrid and online learning has impacted face-to-face -face connections and this feeling of belonging and welcoming. I have many conversations with faculty who say, I don't know my students anymore uh, because they just see black squares on their screen and maybe at once in a while, one student. So they'll know that one student's face. So pro by providing opportunities like programming in the library, I hear it time and time again where the faculty members like, oh, you're in my class or classmates, students are saying, oh, you're in my class. <laughs> and they're being, they're able to have those connections face to face. And for many of our, not all, but many of our students, that has been something that they are yearning for as part of their college experience. And so that has been a particular area that we're looking to build, uh, which isn't always uh, easy in a time where you have short staffing and resources are tight. But by getting creative and honestly just partnering with people, count on your partnerships. Chances are if you're recognizing something, there's someone else recognizing that as well. And so if by pooling the limited resources, we're able to put on something that proves to administration or whatever powers that be that this is a, an opportunity to support and, and develop those collaborations and, and connections to students which we know is important for things like retention and graduation and those student success measures that everyone else is paying attention to. Yes, yes, thank you so much for that. Um, Kristen, any further thoughts on anything changed for you since the pandemic and how you're addressing those different needs? I think we're seeing a lot of the same trends. I would just note that, you know, our, um, our building occupancy hasn't rebounded yet compared to what it was pre-pandemic, although we have seen slight upticks of use. And so for us, I think we're really thinking about how do we understand how student needs have evolved and then like what 
what can we offer in the library space that really will meet students where they are and, and meet those sort of emerging needs. But plus one to the Zoom pod rooms and many of the same things that Siobhan and Denise have mentioned. Okay, well, thank you all so much. We are at the end of our time. Um, this webinar was being recorded. Uh, the recording will be made available along with the chat. There were many questions that we weren't able to answer here, um, but I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you again to our amazing panel um, for your many insights and for sharing all of your valuable expertise. Thanks so much.